Broadcasting from the Daystrom Institute in Okinawa, this is Politrex. The time to the Declaration of Human Rights, the United Federation of Planets, the United Nations, World War II, the Dominion Federation War, the Art of War, the Teachings of Sirach, Jesus Christ, Caliphs, the Unforgettable. Hey guys, welcome to this brand new episode of Polytrex. This is our first episode of the year, the brand new year. Please don't turn off your podcast app or your computer or your TV or wherever you are listening to us from. I know usually Barry does the introduction, but my lovely co-host, my brother in arms, Barry DeFord, will not be joining us for this episode he has some personal things going on in his life. Please send him some best wishes. If you follow him on social media, there is just so much going on in his life. And only thing, I feel so helpless. I, I hate that I feel so helpless. I wish I could be there for him physically. Uh, just give him a hug every minute of every hour of every day and just be there for him and do whatever I can. But the best thing I can do is uh, talk to him and let him know that I'm here for him and I love him. So I have let him know. And if you have enjoyed our show so far and if you enjoy Barry and his wonderful opinions and thoughts, please uh, reach out to him on social media or however you can and let him know that you're thinking of him. But for this episode, it'll just be me. So you guys are stuck with me. Much like Captain Picard leaving Data in command of the ship when something goes wrong and they the only person that can stay awake is data Uh, i feel like that is what i have gotten to today so like data i hope to make uh, my captain picard proud and speaking of captain picard we're really excited and today's episode will be about picard the show the cap the character the man we'll i'll try to cover as much of it as i can in the time that we have today but picard live is debuting tonight uh thanks to our wonderful folks at uh Trek geeks who have given Barry his own live show. What could go wrong, right? <laughs> I'm kidding. Barry is wonderful. I'm sure he will kill it. And uh, he is going to talk about Star Trek Picard. And the one of the biggest pulls toward the show is that it's live. So anything can happen. Uh, what's uh, fun is that that's the network we are part of. I have trouble believing that sometimes. I'll that That we are in a network that allows us to be so creative and so crazy and they are the two bill and dan the founders of the network are the two people who out crazy me and out weird me and i'm pretty crazy and weird so that is the biggest compliment i can give them uh, please make sure you check out picard live that by the time this airs i'm sure that show has already come out maybe one or two episodes have been out also so check out star trek picard live being done by barry deford Solo, live, if you can join him live, that is pretty cool too, I believe it's on Facebook. Please don't hate me if that is wrong information. But speaking of uh, just house cleaning stuff that we have to do, one of the cool things that happened to us recently is Star Trek Picard, right? And everybody's getting the reviews out. I'm kind of partial to the reviews on uh, Trek Geeks, but lots of good people out there doing their uh, own things. And... I believe Fansets, who's uh, one our primary sponsor, is they've done a few really cool pins that I've fallen in love with. Uh, and how can you not? There's the Picard Crest pin. There are already a few Picard pins. I believe last year they did, right now, my favorite pin, which is a portrait of Picard, half Locutus and half Picard. So there are a lot of really cool pins that you can check out on fansets.com. Uh, there is, here's the best part. We... This little crazy weird show that tries to bring politics, culture, and Star Trek together got a discount code. So if you guys have not checked out the website, hey, here's the best incentive I can give you to check out the website right now. We have a 15% discount code. You just have to use the discount code. It's really, really, it might be a little difficult to remember, so you might want to write it down. It's Polytrex. That's the discount code, guys. P-O-L-I-T-R-E-K-S. Honestly, Polytrex is pu- proud to have Fansets as its presenting sponsors. Fansets is the place for amazing pin collectibles with over 200 officially licensed Star Trek pins and new releases every month. Stay tuned 
for a special discount code good on your next order at fansets.com is what the boilerplate says but you don't have to stay tuned because i already gave you the code just in case you did not write it down it's polytrex p o l i t r e k s fansets are been zap character all right on to the news Let's see what is going on in the world of news. It's been a really slow burn uh, for as far as all the impeachment and Trump stuff goes. Uh, this is being recorded the Sunday after the airing of the Picard show, so this is twenty six January, and the Democrats presented their trial. It's it's like you know, it's not whatever the power in the measure of a man the trial is. This is the opposite of that. the republicans have it's like if bruce maddox stood there and he decided to not allow any evidence any witnesses and he just manufactured a way to just take data and tear him apart that's what this is like uh, the impeachment itself has strong power and a, a lot of moral political social ground to cover but the republicans decided at the 11th hour to not allow any witnesses or evidence what is a trial without evidence that's that is so cunning the cardassians would be proud you know i think the point of this exercise is to show that as adam schiff put it the right still matters and that is that brings me back to measure of a man in which uh, picard talks about how you know one broken link in a chain and the the power of that chain and what happens when a link breaks and it is really hard to deal with everything that is going on but the glimmer of hope still burns brightly it might be one candle trying to light up a castle we know that is not going to happen but the fact that the candle still burns in spite of strong cold winds blowing at it from every direction is really powerful and really moving so that is still going on uh the forest fires in australia you know we on the show talk about environmentalism we did a couple of episodes on environmentalism i don't know much to say but the heartbreaking thing is i remember reading somewhere and i will try to post this article on our polytrex twitter page uh that's twitter.com/polytrex i'll try to post it there but i believe 1 billion animals died in uh, the australian fires if we cannot take care of animals i i will do my best not to get emotional you guys i'm sorry uh, what kind of a species are we if we cannot if we climbed up the the food chain the intelligence chain the survival chain and we are now the dominant species of the planet and all we're doing is destroying it it's like if somebody gave you the enterprise and you decided on the first run of it to not take on an engineering team to not take on a navigation team to not take on a medical team but just sit on the ship and go as fast as you can with all the warp speed that you can and just never stop it's like a it's an ouroboros it it makes no sense to me that we got to this place on the planet and instead of doing our best to protect it we are burning it down if you're watching it burn down i feel like we are burning it down what's the difference but the fact that 1 billion animals went extinct and many of the species have been declared extinct is uh, it's a moment of reckoning and a moment of self reflection and and a horrible horrible time for the animals on our planet they deserve better than us as the de facto leaders of thought and the continuation of things on the planet and i'm sorry there isn't a whole lot of good news but uh we will get into some of the good news but i believe for me the best news is that star trek picard is out and that means we can talk about that show uh, which for every person who ever thought oh this star trek shouldn't be political oh boy does this show get political which get which is really exciting for me and for Barry 
just some more sad news uh we haven't done an episode in a couple of months but while we were uh while we were gone we did our final episode was uh, before we left was uh, in memory of uh, Aaron Eisenberg and over our break we found out that we lost uh, our beloved odo and i don't know uh what it is about uh Star Trek Deep Space Nine that 2019 did not like at all, uh, but it took away two of our beloved cast members, and that was a really difficult. Uh, and emotionally complex time to process. Rene Auberjonois lived to the age of 79. I personally think 79 is a really good age to live through. I'm going to be lucky if I make it through 30. You guys, the way I eat Taco Bell. And the way I run like I am road runner for three days and then just lay in bed for the remainder of the week. So here's hoping, fingers crossed. <laughs> but uh, so it was, it was really difficult. I think the age of 79 is a good age to live through. And uh, if you think about it, it's uh, kind of... Uh, poetic and touching that René Auberjonois found success or at least like worldwide success much much later in life when he was in his late 40s early 50s is when he was doing Deep Space Nine it is very nice to know that he was a part of this family and we got to experience him and we were lucky enough to get that side of him all to ourselves and now he lives on in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, and he will for generations, and that is wonderful. Uh, but we are going to miss Odell, and it's heartbreaking, and it's sad, and uh, that was just really difficult as well. But I'm so glad I have so many hours of uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine to watch, enjoy, and rewatch again and again. Anyway, the big news item is that Star Trek Picard is out. And uh, I don't know if it's really newsworthy, but the fact that the show has a 92% on Rotten Tomatoes is pretty cool, guys. And it's certified fresh. And I'm going to talk a little more about how I felt about the show and give you my review and compare it to some of its influences and the influences I picked out. That's what I saw. Maybe you guys saw something else. And I would love to hear... Uh, what you guys thought of the show so when you listen to this episode please make sure you get on twitter twitter.com slash polytrex tag us on at polytrex tell us what you thought of the show and you know we are big boys we can take it if you didn't like the show you did not like the show uh, and that's okay but if you loved it man please tell us how much you loved it because we loved it so much uh, watching the show enjoying the show i'll talk to you through that experience but the, the news part is that it's 92%. And if you were on YouTube a month ago and you typed Star Trek Picard, there were so many quote-unquote YouTubers who loved flanking on the show and saying, oh, Picard is in trouble. And it's not Star Trek, it's a Star Wreck. One of those catchy uh, people saying stuff like that. But here we are. Show is at a ninety-two percent. I don't know if they, I don't know if a ninety-two percent is a star wreck. I don't know what these people are expecting. Maybe Code of Honor is uh, more in line with their version of Star Trek. But I'm really excited to talk to you about Star Trek Picard. So with the with all the news that I could uh, remember and t- remember being newsworthy and talking to you about the the bad and the good things that I wanted to share with you, it's uh, it's time for the main topic which is uh, the show, specifically the first episode of the show right now. Only episode one is aired. So that is the one I can talk about. But as an enthusiast, a fan, and uh, someone who read the comic series, if you have not, I highly recommend you check that out. I believe Picard Countdown number three comes out this Wednesday. You can find my review on treknews.com. Treknews.net, my bad. But anyway, let's move on to the main topic. I, I'm excited to talk to you about Star Trek.
All right, you guys, we are back, and I am excited to talk to you all about a little show that debuted this week around the world called Star Trek Picard. Pa pa na pa 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 pa. Oh, I'm so excited! Uh, this is my I'm I'm tr- I'm getting all my Dan voices out of the way before I start talking to you seriously about the show. Just in case you've been living under a hotel and you do not. Know what is going on? There's a new show out called Star Trek Picard, star- starring Sir Patrick Stewart as Jean Luc Picard. He is back along with some surprises in the show, which is really exciting to you. Uh, the show came out, uh, but there there are a couple of things I wanted to point out to you about the actual response to the show. One of the things I really enjoyed is our uh, review on. Remembrance, the first episode, it's the one, the first review I want you to go out and check is uh, the one on treknews.net, which is, I'm not just saying that because I'm part of the website, I'm saying that because it's a wonderful review. And another one is the review on Trek Code written by everyone's favorite enterprise extra, Jim Morehouse. Uh, he wrote that on trekcode.com. It's a lovely, lovely breakdown of the actual synopsis. And one of the, uh, one of the things that I really enjoyed is how how deep uh, Jim gets into the details, and he talks about he he compares what has come before and what is happening now, and he give he shares some really powerful, wonderful thoughts that he had through the watching of the show, and that's such a good review. That I th- I feel like that's a great. I I wish you would review things more often. Uh, uh, if he if he reviewed every episode, I hope he does on Trek or I will definitely go back and read them. But on to the show. So this show began really to us in the real world at Star Trek Las Vegas 2018. I was in that room. I have talked about that experience when we did our uh, 2018 recap. Uh, but Sir Patrick Stewart walks into... Uh, the 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 I, I believe it's the I forget the name of the hall, but the main hall, and it was a surprise appearance, and he declares John Lou Picard is back, and a an year and four-ish months later, here we are, guys. Uh, John Lou Picard is back, and boy, is it a return to form for Star Trek. I feel like this the show. Uh, the, before we get into it, there will be spoilers across the discussion of this episode. So if you're not all about the spoilers, uh, I recommend that you pause our episode, make sure you watch the first episode, Remembrance, then you come back to us and listen to us. And we we can all enjoy the show together. But back to the actual episode and the creation of the show. In the past few months, everybody has been seeing the PR campaign go wild of Star Trek Picard. Now, uh, as someone who is a huge fan of not just TV shows and movies as they come, but someone who's a fan of the film and TV show industry, when people get invited to things like premieres, and we are not that important, nobody would ever invite us to like a Star Trek premiere. But uh, I saw a bunch of people getting invited to the premiere of the show. And uh, there were a few premieres across around the world. The two that I know of are uh, one that happened in LA, I believe, and the other that happened in London. I'm, there might be another one or two, I'm not sure. But so these premieres happened a couple of weeks before the actual show came out. What was delightful is just the love that was poured on the show. And everybody was saying, oh, it looks like Picard is back to form. This is wonderful. This is awesome Star Trek. Now, you can take that with a grain of salt. I do, because they did that. Uh, Critics do this all the time. They did that for uh, movies like Batman v Superman and The Justice League, which are not, in my opinion, not good movies. But when when it's a premiere, you're invited to a premiere, you have to understand that it's not just what you're watching, it's an experience. Like, people get goodie bags, people get really delicious food like the cast and crew is there and uh, it's kind of a celebratory experience that uh, most of us in the world will not get to have so uh, bottom line 
when the premiere came out, I remained cautiously optimistic. It was nice to know that everybody was enjoying it. Like our lovely uh, founders of the network, I believe Bill and Dan were also there at the premiere. They shared their thoughts. It was very positive all around. And that was great. But p- part of me, the cynical part of me, was a little, a little con- not concerned, just a little apprehensive. Because I did not know... You know, whether they were just talking about the experience and they were seeing those good things about the show because they got to go to the premiere and have this red carpet experience or whether because the show was actually good. And after watching the debut episode, you guys, the show is amazing. I can't in recent... I can't remember... A better debut episode for a Star Trek show. I'm struggling. I am not sure if I can think. I mean, all the episodes are great. Before this, my favorite was Star Trek 2009 as like a debut of a series, you know. And that still has such a powerful place in my heart. I I don't think anybody can take that away. But... I cannot remember a show that is that started off better, especially in our in our uh, Star Trek circle, than Picard did because it is expert storytelling, and you can tell because it was written by a guy who won a Pulitzer Prize for telling stories. So, uh, Michael Chabon, the current showrunner, and that is amazing that we got someone like that to do this. I I don't know. Now that I go back to it, I don't know why I was struggling with the show. I should have... It's kind of on me too. I tried to not jump on the bandwagon a little sooner. I wasn't shouting on it a whole lot uh, on social media. Except the one thing that did happen is uh, on social media, on my Twitter, twitter.com slash gutten underscore hero, I think a couple of days before the premiere, I wrote two tweets. The first one was, hey, if... You know, welcome, the, if this is your first show of Star Trek that we've ever seen, welcome and don't let, you know, the gatekeepers around here bully you to saying, if this is where you're starting and you call yourself a fan, you're not a real fan because that's not true. The point of the show and you becoming a fan is that this show made you a fan and don't let anybody else define that for you. And my God, the rats came out of the woodwork, you know? Is that, a, is that a thing? I don't know if rats come out of the woodwork. The rats came out of the sewers. And just all these accounts, like, one after another, people jumping on it and saying, oh, you're gatekeeping for saying that. And, oh, saying that you should watch something older and better is not gatekeeping. Oh, my. It was, it was nuts. But, you know, all publicity is good publicity. I'm sure all of this indirectly helped the show somewhere. But, you know, when there are people like this out there, it can deter the casual fans. And that is a little disturbing and sad. But I remained a little apprehensive about the show before I saw it because which this is technically a sequel to Star Trek Nemesis. If you take examples from pop culture, uh, the, the really the one, one the only two or three things come to mind of things that worked as sequels that came decades after its prequels, like uh, Bad Boys for Life. If you guys haven't checked that out, that's a really good movie. Uh, Blade Runner 2049. We will talk about Blade Runner quite a bit in this episode, so brace yourselves. Uh, That worked for me, but, you know, a lot of these sequels coming out decades after, they are not usually things that work. And you can have all the good people behind the camera and everybody can come into it with their best intentions but if it doesn't work it doesn't work so all this to set you up for when i watched the actual premiere so the show came out thursday i could not see it right away because i had to go to work in the morning i would i wish i had woken up early enough to do it but i don't know how many of you have a dog if you don't and if you can please get a dog please adopt but uh my lovely dog gentle zord one of the lovely things Zod does in the bed is we he sleeps on the bed with me. Oh, shut up. Don't judge me. Don't pretend like you don't do that yourself. You snobby Trekkie. Uh, but 
I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just, I wish Barry was here so I could deflect all this n- sarcastic humor toward him, but he's not. So you guys have to bear the brunt. Deal with it. Now, I'm, I know all seriousness. I'm so glad you're here. That was a joke. Yada, yada, yada. I've gotten in trouble before for making jokes with the best of intentions. So I would rather not do that, especially when there's nobody here to check me. But one of the lovely things that Zod does is he is a really expert master cuddler. So he, when he is sleeping next to you, unless there is the real life that is compelling you to come out and just deal with the world, you don't want to do that. Well, some of the silly things, like if somebody knocks at the door, I will genuinely, if I'm in bed, ask myself, is this really important enough for me to go? And I will have a moment where I'll be like, if I go... I will lose this wonderful cuddling time with my puppy. So th- that morning, it was it was particularly cold. Uh, I'm talking to you from Little Rock, Arkansas, and it is chilly right now, man. It is freezing. And as an Indian who grew up in a tropical country, if it's 75, I want to wear two jackets and wear a hoodie and cover my face with a like a mask and... So, you know, for someone like that, if it's 20, 25, it's not, it's not fun. Uh, so all that to say, I had not woken up early enough to see it. So as soon as I came back from work, I put it on, I watched it. And I, from the first moment, boom, the show starts. First moment, it's like, uh, you, you, it's like a very, it's like the video that would play in the background when a symphony plays, you know? Or uh, like something you'd see in a museum that is trying to, that is talking about the cosmos, or the something from the show Cosmos. I think that's the doc, the documentary series on uh, Discovery. And it starts, and you see the Enterprise just sailing toward you, and then it go it zooms in to uh, inside one of the rooms, and you see a lovely, lovely captain man. Just sitting there playing poker with data. Here's the incredible thing that they did. Is that you, you can, uh, and Trek News did this. They, they shared a video, so you can check it out if you want. If you, you can connect the last scene of the final episode to the first scene of uh, Picard. The last scene of the final episode of uh, TNG to Remembrance. The first scene of Remembrance. And that's pretty incredible. Uh, the Jean-Luc and... Data, they're playing poker. And Picard looks older. Data looks older, which makes sense. You can just, from that moment, you can tell the amount that this show is going to not be a fun, happy, cheerful experience. It's going to be reflective and somber. And yeah, it's going to be dark and it's going to deal with what the world has become because that's what the best of Star Trek does. It's... It's a reflection of who we are and where we are in the real world. But above all, you can tell Jean-Luc has a mountain of the sadness that is weighing on him. And you, and you realize as you watch the, the scene progress, it's because he knows that. And we know that this is not real because Data is supposed to be dead. And uh, Jean-Luc and Data are playing poker and... Uh, at one point, uh, Data puts his cards down, and they're queens, guys. They're all queens. They're all cues. How cool is that? Data remarks that John Luke looks worried, and John Luke says, "Oh, it's because I don't want the game to end." That's a that's an incredible, powerful line. And then, as as they keep going, you see in the background Mars shows up, and explosions are happening all across Mars. And then immediately he wakes up. And we, what we all suspect is real, it's a dream. Uh, what was wonderful about that opening scene, I won't do it for the entire show, I won't go through scene by scene, or maybe I should at some point, but what I really liked about the opening scene is it explores the power of dreams and the things that people think about when they're dreaming. Whether you're in Star Trek 
whether you are in Blade Runner again another connection to Blade Runner you guys you guys should really watch Blade Runner there are so many connections to Blade Runner and i'm going to call this episode the Blade Runner of Star Trek i'm going to call it Star Trek Picard the Blade Runner of Star Trek because i feel like this is the Blade Runner version of Star Trek and much like in Blade Runner where you see all these characters dreaming and talking about memories and Decker dreaming about unicorns and what does that mean uh, but above all th- this show uses the power of dreams very well and unlike discovery which uses the power of memory very well and expertly and in a in a really uh classy artistic way this show uses dreams because you you see how powerful it is and what the the crux of the show is going to be because you know an ordinary man would not care about the death of an android but we are dealing with picard who's not he once stood on trial and put his entire reputation on the line to ensure the freedom of an android so of course that is the thing that weighs on him so much is the death of this android and then you see what else weighs on him as the show progresses but the fact that that is what sets up the show and that is what it starts and the fact that this was really powerful to me is that he does not want the game to end and in a way that was speaking to me and i believe to us as an audience because we don't want the game to end we don't want the story of picard to be over uh, we didn't when nemesis happened we don't now but much like with the end of that dream the game does end and it's interesting to me that Well, one of the touch points of the show is Logan the movie in which Patrick Stewart reprised his role of Professor X for the last time for now for the last time in and he dies and the fact that that is one of the touch points sets up just interesting things about where the show is going and what will happen at the end i am preparing myself for the show to be end or at least uh get closer to the finale with the death of picard i feel like that is what it will be and hopefully it is not as sad uh, or as tragic as the dream we see in the beginning and what it makes us feel so anyway uh we we wake uh we see picard go through uh, the things that he goes through in his life you see uh, jeban and lares are his two caregivers that are living with him on a vineyard or his vineyards and uh, his wonderful dog that everybody is now in love with number 1 a pitbull i love pitbulls uh, again if you guys are thinking about adopting see if you can adopt a pitbull they're the loveliest sweetest dogs man uh, here's an interesting connection or a diversion so jaban and laris if you've read the star trek picard countdown series you know that these are two people of who have a really deep connection with picard and that's one of the first connections to star trek picard countdown that i noticed is that jaban and laris are actually former members of the tal shiar and picard countdown takes place a decade or so before the show starts and in it you see jean luc and where he is when the romulan supernova happened oh i'm sorry it's the it's been 20 years right it's been 20 years since the uh supernova happened so you see where uh, jean luc is and you find out in the comic that he is sent there to help rescue a bunch of uh, people from one of the planets that is in the collision course of that supernova it's in the impact zone so he goes down there and of course it's uh, a romulan colony and they find out that while while they're there uh that they've kind of slaved an entire planet's people they've made slaves out of the natives of a planet and they're all uh, just working for them what well, we i assume as slaves but they're just natives is what the romulan leader tells picard and picard asks okay well we want to take them out uh how many of them are there and the leader says oh there are tens of millions of them and then picard goes no that is not what we were told we were told that 
the rescue is for 10,000 people. And the Romulan leader says, yeah, that's the people that are getting out and they're all the Romulans. It'll be ridiculous to take all these natives out. They're primitive and they're dumb. Why are we, why do we need to take them out? So that kind of becomes the conflict of the comic book series. And of course, how it gets resolved is what you'll find out in issue three since the book is not out yet. Maybe it'll be out by the time uh, this episode comes out, but I don't want to risk it. But anyway, you find out that Jaban and Laris, uh, so after this happens, Picard stays back and is quietly hatching a plot to find a way to get all the natives out of there from under these Robinins. And you find out that the, there are two other people involved who also want to help them and they are members of Tal Shiar, uh, but they're kind. They, they've been asked to get there and just be spies, but they cannot, in good conscience, allow this to happen. So they are ready to help Jean Luc. So another interesting connection is on the ship. I believe it's the the ship is called the Verity in Star Trek Picard: Calm Down, the comic book series uh, that Picard is the captain of. You know who his first officer is? It's Rafi Musikur who's being played by Michelle Hurd, who's in the show. So we find out where she is and what happens in the show, but she has an interesting connection there, like a very deep connection. And that is that she is his first officer, at least on this mission and in the ship. So that's when we find, we'll find out through the show, I'm sure, what happened to her. But Jaban and Laris are these two Tal Shiar agents who essentially go rogue after realizing what Picard wants to do. And when the plot events resolve, you find out what happens between Jaban, Laris, and uh, Picard and how they end up on the vineyard. But anyway, interesting connection there that I really liked and f felt really good to me. Because as you read issue three or just the, the whole series as together, you, you, you think the story is about one thing and you think it's about the Romulan supernova and how that goes. And that is covered. Uh, but you really realize it's the story of what how these three come together. How Jaban, Laris, and Picard come together. And that was really interesting to me. So that's the benefit of reading comics, you guys. If you haven't gotten on that train, the comics train, I highly recommend you get into it. Uh, it's also co-written by Mike Johnson, who's the dopest Star Trek writer, but also by Kirsten Beyer, who's one of the creators and executive producers of Star Trek Picard. So why wouldn't you buy them? Anyway, so that was felt really interesting to me uh, that Jaban and Laris who are now taking care of Picard and helping him go through life. That was pretty touching. I loved all the interactions with number one. I loved how good number one is and such a lovely, lovely dog. But, you know, that's not where you really take the show. Then you find out that it's, uh, you you go into Daj's character, who this, at least in the, the, the previews, and that's what the good previews do. They really set you up as Daj being this, main character that the show will kind of be focused on and I think in a way it will it will be but you find out that Daj is this Daj is a synthet synthetic you meet Daj and her boyfriend and they are both talking about their future and Daj points out that yeah she is about to join the Daystrom Institute because she studied artificial intelligence her entire life young woman very promising very smart so as her boyfriend and she talk about everything that's going on and her future, these agents, these, the best connection I have is people wearing non-lit, and when I say lit, I mean like actual lit up Daft Punk outfits just show up out of nowhere and they murder her boyfriend. And they start talking about how she's not activated yet. And that was really... Interesting to me, but immediately she becomes this Jason Bone type character and something does activate within her and she takes them out in seconds and then she has a vision of Jean-Luc Picard. Again, the power of memory and the power of visions and the subconscious is, is being touched upon. So I love that that was her introduction. But as you, you know already, she's really not the, at least not the, physically the center of the show because she does eventually find uh, Picard and they go to the Daystrom Institute to try to find answers but she she dies like she's killed and you find out why she's killed and uh, it's because there are and I guess we'll find out more about why she's killed and that's really going to be part of the 
the center of the show and uh you but you know by this time it's uh romulans who are doing this so again the show connects to goes back to the romulan supernova and over the discussions of the actual show you find out what exactly is going on and what i believe the center of at least season 1 will be is that after the supernova happened the romulans they reach out and they say hey we want to relocate and of course john luke being who he is he goes out and he tries to rescue these people he leaves the enterprise but as he starts helping them he realizes that there is conflict within starfleet because not everybody wants to help them uh, because they are quote as the interviewer puts it quote and quote there is oh, i'm jumping around so much i'm sorry you guys i'm just so excited to talk to you about the show i forget that sometimes structure helps but then we cut back to, so anyway we cut back to this interview with uh, jean luc and he is talking to this interviewer about what's going on in his life and where he is now and you find out that picard left the 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 federation kind of unceremoniously in protest and that is because after the supernova as i just told you the romulans ask for help picard reaches out you see, he sees that there's conflict within starfleet because people do not want to help uh, people relocate and it's it, the touching point or the touching moment in that interview was uh, she says you know there but why would we save 20000 romulan lives and he's like no 20000 lives which really is a shows you who picard is and how why he is such a unique captain uh, because to him they're all lives and ultimately that's what he cares about is life and the the pursuit of life and the rights that everybody has to basic life but clearly at that point the federation did not see it why so you find out that uh, during the relocation uh there was conflict and one of the things that really tips things over is during all the relocation on mars in the utopia planitia shipyards uh there were almost 100,000 people killed but get this by synths what they call synths or rogue synthetic life forms now that is what you would imagine data would be so i believe in the continuity of the show somebody please correct me online if i if i mess this up but bruce maddox goes off and he creates a bunch of these uh synthetic life forms and while this rescue was happening uh there was a there's a rescue fleet that was on march and uh, a group of these synths a, essentially a, a bunch of these rogue uh the the synthetic life forms something happened in them and they went rogue we'll i guess we'll find out why but these continuation in the chain that was being created by madox they they attack this rescue fleet they kill almost 100000 people you know the rescue fleet of course was also killed and of course starfleet being starfleet they call upon a ban on all artificial lives they immediately stop the rescue so the romulans people are left to themselves the, the as the romulan people are left in disarray they call up the rescue and all artificial life is banned now bad barry will talk to you more about this on picard live i'm sure but it is very interesting to me that this comes at a time when there's a muslim ban in which a bunch of uh, muslim nations have been banned from entering the united states because there were terror attacks from muslim countries but saudi arabia is not one of the banned nations even though that's where most of these attacks from muslims came from on the country but that's economic reasons but that's the again different discussion but that felt really powerful to me and here's another uh, connection to blade runner and why i think the show owes so much to blade runner in a good way is the beginning of blade runner is deckard being asked to investigate or it, in, like their quote and quote investigate by the police force but really go and kill these rogue sins that went rogue and killed a bunch of people and escaped and now they're out and about uh they were off world now they're on planet earth we need we need to go and find them deckard i need you to go and kill them so the conflict uh seems very similar to me to blade runner that you know this let's ban everything 
because a few people did something. And not just that. Uh, one of my favorite shows of all time, Battlestar Galactica. This this the story owes so much to Battlestar Galactica too because Cylons or what the, those people like to call skin jobs, which is like their way, their derogatory term for Cylons. Uh, again, same thing. Uh, of course, the Battlestar Galactica show has much more of a reason because they commit genocides and essentially destroy humanity uh, and leave just this one ship of people alive. Uh, the Cylons do. But they also do this thing where, you know, these people did this. Let's completely isolate and quarantine them and take them out of the discussion. And now they're all banned. Now, uh, as this interview goes on, uh, Daj sees what's happening and she show, she finds him. She sees him on the screen because this interview is being aired everywhere. And uh, she just... She she sees him and she had a vision of Jean-Luc Picard and now she sees him. So you're kind of believed, uh, you're kind of led to believe that there is going to be a connection at some point. But this time, again, we go back to another dream. Power of dreams, you guys. Uh, Jean-Luc is having a dream. He is in a field and he sees data in the distance painting. And he goes, and they're both in their TNG uniforms, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, it is the first time in the century that those guys have worn that uniform, at least on screen. He gets his dreams where he sees that Data is doing a painting. So he goes up to the painting and uh, Data ha pans over the paintbrush and says, Captain, can you finish this? And Picard looks at the painting and it's this woman standing by the sea covered in uh, wearing a hood. Uh, and But her face is not... Uh, you, you don't really see the face until the very end, but you find out that it's a woman just mysteriously dressed, standing by a shore and the water is rising and falling in front of her. And then you see that that is Daj's face. And so he takes a trip. He goes to San Francisco. He goes to his archives, right? Like the Starfleet archives. And you find out that there is an entire section dedicated to Captain Picard. And uh, everybody's talking about all the things they spotted there, but... What was lovely was uh, seeing the Captain Picard Day banner because it's amazing that he saved that. And uh, Will Wheaton in his Ready Room show asks uh, Michael Chabon and Culpepper about what that means. And they have a wonderful answer to that. So make sure Ready Room is on YouTube, at least for us in the US audiences, it is. So you should go and check that out. That's pretty cool. Anyway, so he goes there and in his archives, uh, you find out that you find you see the painting and uh you find out that data actually painted in you don't see the face really until that point where it's like almost like a, re, there is no really powerful uh oh uh, just this loud popping music show oh my god it's Daj's face that data painted on the painting but uh again the subtle lovely music of the show is just awesome and uh, Jeff Russo, I believe is his name, uh, is our composer. He also does the music for uh, Discovery. It, it makes sense why they brought him back because he is, as a fan of soundtracks, this is a soundtrack that I can go back to over and over, or score, technically, uh, that I can go back to again and again and listen to because it's so, it's it's uh, it's not fast. It's not Michael Giacchino's Star Trek score, which has a place and a lovely place in my heart. Uh, but it's a very slow, contemplative, thoughtful show. Much like, I'm going to say it, Blade Runner. And uh, just those uh, slow, violin-based music. Anyway, so you see the, the painting in the archives, and it turns out uh, that Data had actually painted Taj's face as that woman. And the painting, get it, you guys? It's called Daughter. Boom. How good is that? Just uh, the the way it was led to for us to believe and the good thing that they did with all the previous is nobody gave it away. Everybody saved these uh, these big reveals for the actual show. Daj is uh, Data's daughter, or at least in whatever connection they're going to make and tell us how that happened, she is in that painting that Data called daughter. So uh, I believe this is where 
Daj finds out where Picard is. This is the second time they they've already met on the vineyard, but then they meet again. And before like they can do anything really with that information, uh, there is a powerful scene where Daj talks about, you know, I don't know where I, what's going on with me. I don't know what's happening. And then she shares her memories, and then Picard tells her who she really is, and she doesn't refuse to believe it. And she says, "If that is who I am, I'm horrible." And then again, Picard being Picard, he's like, "No, you're actually very special." And you're very special to me. Uh, and because in, in her, he sees another data. He sees a chance at redemption. And he lost uh, data once. He lost a very special kind of life form once. And he's really struggling, hoping that this is his redemption and that he does not, he can maybe save her. But of course, that doesn't happen because Dash gets killed uh, by uh, the similar Romulan... Uh, warrior daft punky guys who kill her on the rooftop of course he cannot they're, they're both on the rooftop Daj gets killed and really I feel like that is where this that is the uh, the motivation point for Picard because now he, go, he he saw what happened to Daj but then he finds out a little bit about what the world is and where Dash comes from and what all this means. Uh, Dash also gives him his her locket that she's been wearing that is is two circles. It's it's a metal uh, chain with the pendant being two circles. Anyway, so he has that. He takes it to the Daystom Institute in Okinawa where he meets Dr. Agnes Jurati, who's played by Alison Pill. If you guys have not seen the newsroom, Alison P- Pill plays a reporter on that show i highly recommend you guys check it out if you have amazon prime she's that show is on there it's three seasons so it won't take long but it's a lovely show and she plays a very 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 powerful character but in this show you find out that there is this uh, uh doctor called dr agnes jurati who is at that day's to institute and they both start talking to each other and <laughs> it seems like they have a past connection and they're friends they have some kind of a relationship uh, and Picard mentions a certain kind of android existing or the possibility of that android existing and then uh, during the course of their conversation you find out that Daj was actually an android that was probably cloned from data and they don't know if that technology has been duplicated yet uh, but oh, this is also where, uh, during these discussions, uh, Doctor Agnes shows like where the where the the actual remainder of B four is. Now, if you remember in Nemesis, you can see B four being there, uh, as and he's the one that's left at the end. But you see him here dismantled in a in a little container put away, like he's a he's a, a kitchen utensil that we don't have any need for right now. It was, it was really tragic and sad. Uh, but it's also, you know, that's the nature of what, what happens to things like those when Picard is not there and they just get dismantled and they're put away because that's the the power of the artificial life. Man. But anyway, of course, you find out that Bruce Maddox uh, used something called fractal neuronic cloning or neuronic cloning. And... So he essentially used data and B4 and all, all the things that he could find and he created Daj. But here's the cool thing. You find out that Daj was created in a pair. So there is a twin called Soji. And then you find out that as as this reveal happens and they're like, and then Picard is like, ah, oh, so there's another. And that just that moment washes over him. You find out that you you move into this mysterious location where you uh, where you see Narek, a Romulan agent, uh, who's walking up around like all these bibs and bobs in this really dark black architecture, and then he walks up to Soji, and then you see oh wait that is the 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 twin the the two were created, they were created in pairs, that's Soji, and she is at a site with a Romulan named Narek, and they start talking about, you know, their future and their life, and uh, the camera zooms out, it zooms out, keeps zooming out, keeps zooming out, 
ba-boom. And this is where the music saves itself to hit you in the fields as this reveal happens. And you find out that they both are in a bar cube, in a remanufactured, repurposed bar cube. So, you guys, that's where the episode ends. But that's where really the story begins for me. And it was so, so delightful to watch an episode. So I really was not hoping, <laughs> I really was not planning to do a scene by scene, but I guess I kind of did that because I, there are so many things I want to talk about. But as the episode progressed, I've seen it a couple of times now, as the episode progressed, it was clear that it took so much from Blade Runner. And that's the reason why I call it the Blade Runner Star Trek in the best possible way. That's what Star Trek has always been, right? If you think about all these episodes, what's Measure of Man, if not like a more powerful Perry Mason episode, right? And what's, you know, uh, what, what are all the mirror episodes, if, if not for like, uh, that shows that have these fantasy, like, sword and sandal drama-ish elements. And what are all the spy episodes, if not something like uh, like out of a Mission Impossible, like the 70s Mission Impossible show, or uh, other spy episodes and movies. So Star Trek has always drawn influences and taken its structure from various kinds of storytellings. And it's wonderful that this time they've done it with Blade Runner. At least to me, because I'm such a fan of both those movies, Blade Runner and Blade Runner 2049. I felt so many connections to Blade Runner. So much like in Blade Runner, like I was saying earlier, the story is about, or at least partly about, synths, or what they call skin jobs in Blade Runner also. And in Battlestar Galactica, that's used as a derogatory term. But in Blade Runner, they're replicants. In uh, Battlestar Galactica, they're Cylons. And we find out here, those synthetic life forms that have gone rogue are synths. Uh, S-Y-N-T-H-S or synthetic life forms that are banned. And it's really, I feel like the show is a mystery. And at least that's what it will be with all... The action pulls you in. There is action in the show and it's really good. But I feel like uh, the show is actually going to be more of a mystery. And it's this uh, puzzle box that, you know, you don't know what's inside and you keep opening it. It's like uh, It's like the Russian doll the Russian nesting doll. We keep opening, keep opening, keep opening. And it goes from bigger to smaller. So the show does not do the ba 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 the, the Enterprise coming in. Oh, uh, face of fire. Oh, shoot that ship. Warp speed. I don't think the, sh the show will do any of that. Instead, it will use the world of Star Trek to tell a slow burn of a story like Blade Runner. So Blade Runner uses science fiction and dystopia to tell a story about humanity. And that's why the show is uh, taking so much for, from Blade Runner to me. And I have zero problems with it because that is a really good show to take from. And much like Blade Runner, there's a central character. There's, I, you can now tell the show why the show is called Picard. And much like Blade Runner, uh, Picard is struggling with something really deep and complex and things that he cannot understand. And he's dreaming. And his dreams are really the most telling things in the episode and what he's thinking about and what he is really weighing on him much like in Blade Runner, where uh, you find out so much about Deckard from what he's dreaming about and all these things that are weighing on him. Uh, and much like uh, Blade Runner, Picard interacts with a synth. Uh, so we find, of course, not in the same way as uh, Deckard does with Rachel. But again, the interaction is with a synth and you find out he goes to he goes to a place to find out information, then goes to another place to find out more information. So it's an investigative drama, is what it feels like to me, at least so far. So the first episode of Remembrance felt much like a, a Blade Runner episode set in the world of Star Trek. But of course you choose Picard to tell the story, because, you know, who else to tell the story of these very unique, these different kinds of life forms that have changed or evolved or come to a different crossroads than we have then the man who once argued for one of them uh, and staked his entire reputation staked the life of that android uh, so of course why would you choose anybody else to tell that story except that guy and I for one I am really happy and excited I love the first episode loved everything about it not a minute felt wasted I didn't feel like at any point it became an ionic beam and 
new, 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 even though there is like a neuron cloning, it's not like neutron infused phase beams. Like there wasn't a whole lot of techno babble. The little that was there felt powerful and it felt essential. So it's clearly Culpepper and Shabon and Kurtzman and Stuart. They knew what they were doing, the story they wanted to tell. And the vision for it is there. So, all in all, uh, as we get closer and closer to a conclusion for this episode, I wanted to tell you just how excited I am that Star Trek Picard is here. I feel like it'll have a really big social impact, at least for those of us that watch the show. The fact that they're doing this while people are trying to build walls and ban people from coming into the country, telling the story of all these artificial lives and why they're banned, and not using data. I felt they're using data, right? And it makes sense why Brent Spiner came back because the story really begins with data. But the fact that they chose to tell it from a different perspective, and I'm sure we'll find out that that perspective will be Soji's, or at least partly Soji's, uh, and how it connects to a really different, not really different, but kind of different life form in the Borg, because they're also, you can make an argument that they're also synths, uh, even though they're not really androids as much as uh, they're, they're just this amalgam of man and machine. Uh, the fact that that is where they're going with the story. And the best part, you guys, the best part to me is that I've seen an hour of the 10 hours that we're, we're going to get the show. And really, I kind of feel like I have no idea where it's going to go. And that is perfect for a TV show is if you've seen the pilot, you feel, you know what is being set up. You know, you kind of feel like you know where you are and you can see it. You can all, like Daj's face not being in the painting the first time, right? I feel like I can see the world. I can see the setting. I can see the events that are going to play out the way they're going to play out. Uh, but the fact that I cannot see her face yet is really powerful to me. So by taking inspiration from Blade Runner, taking inspiration from the age-old uh, android versus human story that we found in Battlestar Galactica, and uh, do, by taking on, by taking the more slow contemplative route and not going the, the easiest, cheesiest way, but instead focusing on telling a really powerful story that moves the world forward, uh, I think Star Trek Picard Remembrance is a triumph of an episode. If I'm successful, hopefully we'll get out these review slash celebration slash analysis shows with every episode. If not, maybe every episode, maybe two or three episodes at least. Uh, but we know that we've been absent for a bit and things have been going on in our lives. But we're happy to be back. Hopefully, this will not be another three-month break and we'll get these out more regularly. But, you know, this is what I thought of the show. These are the notes I took. These are the things I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, a lot, lot of cool Easter eggs. Again, I really hope you guys read uh, Star Trek The Card Countdown because I don't want to spoil what happens in issue three and how the conflict ends with the Romulan supernova and everything. But the Jaban and Laris is the biggest one. Uh, the fact that, uh, well, there is uh, Jordi. He is in the Picard Countdown and where he is at the end of the comic is kind of surprising. And we'll find out more once the book comes out and as the show progresses. But all in all, I felt like this Blade Runner inspired, Battlestar Galactica inspired, uh, slow, moving, tragic, funny, unintentionally, intentionally funny, uh, powerful uh, presentation of story from just people who really are fans of this world, people who grew up with this world and are now doing their absolute best to pay an homage and to give life or give a farewell of some kind to Jean-Luc is what really is the, at the heart of the show. And I am so, so excited to see where it goes. I'm excited to meet all the new characters one character I'm really excited about is 709. Cannot wait to see where that goes. I'm also excited to see where Harry Treadaway's character goes. If you have no guys have not seen Penny Dreadful, he plays, get this, Victor Frankenstein in that show. 
Yeah, you guys, he played Dr. Frankenstein. Again, not Frankenstein's monster, but Dr. Frankenstein in the show Penny Dreadful. So you guys should check that out too. And Alison Pills, the newsroom. See, with all these, now you guys have so much stuff that you can watch. Uh, I feel like I shouldn't keep you from it any longer. But if you have enjoyed our episode, please tell us how we did. Uh, please tell us what you liked. And here's a question I've always been curious about. Where are you when you're listening to this episode? You can really please tell me. Otherwise, my, my imagination just takes me to so many places. And I would love to get some concrete answers. Are you in the gym? Does it inspire you to keep going faster on the treadmill when a guy with an Indian accent is talking to you like this about Star Trek and Blade Runner and science fiction? That's awesome. If it does, I hope that's what you guys are doing. Are you on a train? Are you on a bus? Where are you? I would love to know. Tell us on twitter.com slash polytracks, really, or you can tell me personally and I will share it from our shows. Uh, you can find me on at gutted underscore hero. Uh, Barry is uh, not in this episode, but you can also hear his thoughts on the first episode on Picard Live. I'm sure he'll share those today. Uh, he's going to record it today. So that's the Sunday, the 26th, but I'm sure he will. You can find that and listen to us, uh, li listen to our episode. Uh, uh, listen to my thoughts on this episode and then listen to his thoughts on the Picard Love episode. And hopefully I'll have him back soon enough to where we can talk more about Star Trek Picard and maybe there'll be a couple of episodes in and we'll talk about all of that in our uh, coming episodes and we'll go back to some of our older uh, discussions from things all across the universe of Star Trek. But you can f talk to him on, I believe his current Twitter handle is Samurai Pizza Comrade. So that's S-A-M-R-I-P-Z-A C-O-M-R-A-D. Or if you go to Polytrex, you can find in the show description his his uh, Twitter handle is there. But he's been dealing with some things. So I was like, you know, Picard is happening. I feel like we owe it to the fans to at least talk about what I thought. Uh, this I was not expecting this to become a play-by-play -play or a complete Blade Runner fanboying episode. But it, those are the things that I found connections to. And that's what I wanted to share. And I would love to hear what you thought of my analysis, what you thought of my review, what you thought of Star Trek Picard. Tell us all about it when this comes out. But until next time, you guys, live long and prosper and onward to Star Trek. Thank you.